I'd like to welcome everybody who has joined us today for the webinar titled 2019 Updates for APMs in the QPP, What You Need to Know. My name is Scott Mash, and as always, I'm joined here by Ms. Kathy Costello. Now, I am going to forewarn you, the information in today's webinar is very detailed, very heavy. There's a <laughs> lot of information, but Kathy has done a great job really making the information understandable. She's going to serve as your primary presenter today. I'm going to do a little bit of color commentary with that. Ms. Kathy Costello. Thanks, Scott. And hi, everyone. So glad you could join us. It's going to be really interesting webinar today because it falls outside of what I call our typical discussions about MIPS and reporting and stuff. And I would say generally that 2019 is going to be a watershed year as your organizations <clears throat> move ahead and look at participating in um, more of a risk face of a sided model for an alternative payment model. And if you're already there, this should give you some thinking points as to how you can take advantage of these, this new all-payer model. <clears throat> so let's start by talking about what the rules, where we are with the rules. All rules are final right now. With that being said, note that the little red box on the bottom, the ACO rule, is considered final for 2019, but only because a lot of its um, measures were, were dumped into the physician fee schedule rule. But there was a lot left undecided, and that's what I wanted to point out to you. There will be another rule coming out on ACO structure because, uh, as you'll see as we move on, the, the main issue that was not decided <clears throat> in that proposed rule is the question of how much risk bearing there should be. Because CMS's um, models, and we'll look at that, really moved people into a high risk bearing strategy um, very quickly. And if, you're been, if you have been doing Medicare shared savings where you are not uh, accepting risk or not sharing risk with uh, CMS, but only sharing rewards, this could be cold water in the face. So, so you really, CMS had to slow down and look at that again because of all the comments they received, there was quite a bit of criticism around how they were structuring risk. So what we're looking at today and what is final are the provisions found in the physician fee schedule rule, which were extensive for alternative payment models, but most of them were not uh, significant in changing the structure, but they'd, they'd be what I call annual updates as CMS changes the quality metrics and some of the other aspects of the rule. And this rule acts as a bridge to this upcoming rule that will uh, be released, I'm going to guess, within the next two months. They just need to get it going because they want to be able to move groups into a risk-bearing model and to phase out the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Uh, the all-payer model, which we're going to spend a fair amount of time on because it's of such high priority in 2019, a lot of the provisions of the all-payer model were actually found in last year's rule, in the 2018 physician fee schedule rule. So if you're a glutton for punishment and want to look at the original language, uh, these are the two big rules that you'll want to look at. And as I said, there, there was one more rule that will still be coming out, but it will be named totally differently because the uh, 2019 proposed ACO rule was uh, the numbers were subsumed into the physician fee schedule rule. Now, I'm sure you've seen this many, many, many times, and it's the um, bonus penalty chart for MACRA. And it includes on the left-hand side the MIPS bonus and penalty, but what we're going to be talking about today is the right side, the 5% bonus for being a QP as part of an advanced APM. So that's really where a lot of this discussion has and how to get there. Um, but 
always keep this chart in mind because you want to make sure that your providers are covered on on one side or the other because the penalty figures will be so significant moving ahead um, next year and the following year you're, you're up to nine percent in two years okay so let's look at the provisions the criteria that CMS has had in place to this point in time for advanced APMs and how those have changed in that final rule for 2019 the three basic requirements to be an advanced APM is the APM <clears throat> must require the use of certified technology, uh, must have pay, uh, their payments must be linked to quality, so pay for performance, and must have some risk bearing aspect, either under a medical home model or under uh, the standardized risk model. The changes in 2019 were in uh, two out of, of the three of these areas. The technology one is interesting because it'll come in play later in the all payer model. We'll talk about this again. But the threshold for an APM to participate in the CMS programs has risen in, in 2019 from 50% of your providers to 75% must be on certified EHR technology. On the quality side, there were some streamlining of measures, but also, as we, and we'll look at this again when we talk about the all-payer model, CMS is trying to anticipate issues with some of these more specialized APMs and make sure that their uh, quality metrics are really comparable to what you see in the MIPS program. The other thing that um, CMS is going to require, not in 2019 but in 2020 is that there must be at least one outcome measure and that outcome measure must be evidence-based reliable and valid this really does not affect either the MSSP program or the current ACO programs because those all have outcome measures as part of their quality reporting but as I said CMS is really lining up for this this issue of having other payer models come in where they don't have or haven't had control on the way in the door of what those metrics are. The risk uh, acceptance is going to be, um, continue to be, at least at this point, the 8% revenue-based nominal amount for advanced APMs. Uh, I'm not talking about the medical home models, but that's, they basically have extended the 8% for until 2024. The eligibility, this doesn't appear in, in here, but it really was part of the larger physician fee schedule rule. Just note that if you, for any reason, have a provider who does not qualify as a QP, but you want them to receive MIPS bonuses um, and you've submitted data for them, you are going to want to make sure that they opt in. 2019 is the first year that there is an affirmative opt-in for people who might not otherwise have qualified or need to report. So a partial QP, somebody who's in an alternative payment model, doesn't meet the threshold to be a full QP, um, is going to be considered excluded by Medicare or by CMS, not because they could not draw down um, incentives, but because CMS is not placing that burden on you to report for them unless you so desire. And if you want to report to them, you have to affirmatively tell that to CMS so that they then will include them in their payments. And that opt-in process is done through the QPP portal. Logging into the QPP portal, there's gonna be an opt-in process. We haven't seen it yet. Right. Okay, other changes, and this is really the bare bones of what CMS moved ahead with that proposed ACO rule where they didn't finalize that, a lot of it. But the uh, one thing they did do, as I said, it's a bridge between the two rules, is for those of you who are in an MSSP model that ends next month, starting tomorrow, you know, in December, at the end of this year, in 2018, if you want to continue on until 
the end of June of 2019. So for another six months while CMS finalizes the strategy around the new ACO risk bearing model, um, you may do that basically without any penalties or anything. And that extension is granted then until 2019. Let's talk about measures. We'll, we'll handle MSSP issues first, and then we'll look at the all-payer model, and then move on to um, an advanced model in Ohio. So the first thing, as far as uh, the shared savings program and the quality metrics around that, the shared savings is the same way as every other program that CMS has commented on and taken action on in this year with the regulations, and that it is part of the Meaningful Measures Initiative. <clears throat> and I'm sure that you all remember what we have told you in, in previous webinars, that CMS really took a lot of heat from providers, both hospitals, physicians, other provider groups, for the uh, immense amount of overlap in reporting that they have required, especially in the quality metrics, for many of the programs. And for those of you who have providers who participate in more than one program, CPC Plus, uh, you know, MIPS, um, MSSP, you know what I'm talking about. There's just a lot of reporting and a lot of duplication. And the interesting thing, and I, I think this is why, just as a side note, where I don't have a slide on it, but um, CPC Plus, Ohio's the largest CPC plus state in the country by far, by far, we're I think 20% of the total population of CPC plus practices. Um, the CPC plus program next year has only two quality metrics. They've, they've shrunk from 14 to two. And the only two they're doing is um, A1Cs and blood pressure under control. And I think part of this is that a lot of the CPC Plus sites are part of Medicare Shared Savings. And so a lot of the other metrics were already being reported elsewhere. So it's stuff like that. When, when CMS is talking about meaningful measures, I think they're really making an effort to peel back and really look at those metrics and figure out what it is that is duplicative and uh, what doesn't meet their priorities anymore. So in the list of shared savings, you have quite a few. For those of you who have done shared savings for a number of years, think back, how, uh, it wasn't that long ago that you were reporting on 33 or 34 different measures. Um, good and the bad of that, the, the bad obviously is just so much busy work. The good side of it is if you weren't performing well in one area, at least it gave you an opportunity to keep your scores up. So you're going to have to think about that as you see um, how these measures have been reordered for this year. So of the ones that have been removed, and there are quite a few of them, let's kind of take those in pieces. They have removed as a quality metric, not as a requirement for the program, but as quality metric that, um, that at least 50% of your providers are meeting meaningful use. So they, they just totally have removed that because it's already covered in the basis of the overall program. Um, several of these other ones were removed because they were topped out. The MedRec post-discharge, um, the pneumonia vaccine, I honestly think this is going to be changed to the shingles vaccine probably next year, whenever the yeah. shingles vaccine is more available, but probably next year. But right now, a pneumococcal was taken out. Uh, flu is still in. BMI was taken out. Um, the eye exam for diabetes, although the A1C does remain, and the um, use of aspirin in IVD were all removed. As far as the cost metrics, and there's uh, a lot of interesting strategy in the cost area, but the big ones are the SNF. 30-day all-cause readmission, we're going to talk some more about that and what, what that is as far as the nursing home having patients readmitted to the hospital. Um, all, unplanned readmissions for diabetes and heart failure, and then the use of imaging studies for low back pain. The, uh, we're, the low back pain, I just have to tell you, is kind of an interesting one because it was also removed from MIPS. And even though it's a huge priority for CMS when you consider the requirement for appropriate use criteria coming in for your radi uh, 
your scans and stuff. Um, the reality is that they decided to remove it. I think partly because of the duplication and partly because they had a very high participation rate in that, in that measure. The advisory committee for CMS did not want to remove it. They wanted to leave it in because they felt it was a good cost metric, but CMS did not go along with that recommendation. So that is no longer one of your measures. Of your new measures, your, uh, the CAPS, I think most of you are aware of this, has been expanded to include courteous and helpful office staff, um, CAPS care coordination, and the third one, which we're going to talk some more about, is uh, risk of fall assessment. The weight distribution for the four categories of the shared savings quality metrics remain the same. Each one is weighted 25% of your overall score. Okay, let's talk about what has been removed, why it's been removed, and what is what is remains as far as readmission and some of these other metrics. There is a measure, and we'll look at the final list of metrics in, in a slide or two, but the, one of the readmission metrics that remains is one um, which is ACO 38, all-cause unplanned admissions for multiple chronic conditions. One of the reasons and one of the primary reasons that CMS removed the readmission figure for diabetes and heart failure is they found such a high correlation of patients who were coming back in who were being readmitted who had diabetes and heart failure um, with this measure, where if they have multiple chronic conditions, those being diabetes, heart failure, AMI, Alzheimer's or dementia, AFib, uh, kidney disease, COPD, asthma, depression, and stroke. If, if any two of those appear as part of the patient's um, information background, then they get assessed under this measure. And the good thing about this is this is a risk-adjusted measure. So the fact that these are very sick people gets taken into account in the overall scoring. So that is why the ACO 36 that we just looked at was removed and uh, CMS was, was very um, insistent despite comments that they felt that this was a more accurate way of handling these people with multiple chronic conditions. The linkage between the hospital discharge and nursing home readmission is one that I'm sure your organizations are spending more and more time looking at. This whole question, that, and, and I think we started this discussion probably two years ago on the continuum of care and how CMS wants to make sure that there's coordination, and then that leads to the issue of how do you um, partner with uh, acute, or, LTPAC, long-term care and post-acute care um, facilities to improve your readmission rate, but also theirs. Because as many of you know, the readmission rates are something that is part of the quality metrics on both sides of that equation, both the hospital and the long-term care. But how you measure it is what CMS is trying to get at. And they haven't really decided that. So that is why you see them. They have removed the old SNF um, readmission measure, which is um, the ACO 35. And this would be patients who are sent to a skilled nursing facility and then get sent back to the hospital within 30 days and are readmitted. That was the general ACO metric. What CMS is trying to do, and again, this is something that I think you're probably aware of, but I, I, after all the reading that Scott and I do of the regs, we've, we've been very impressed with the fact that you see the same metrics now amongst various groups. I mean, it just runs from one type of facility to the other. And this is one of those cases because what CMS is going to, or is looking at, they haven't decided how they're going to do this, is rather than just saying, what's the patient sent to the skilled nursing facility and then sent back to the hospital within 30 days, 
but they're like, really, we should be looking at the broader picture. Why, what if the patient goes from the hospital to the skilled nursing facility and then does a step down and either goes to a different facility or goes home and has home health, but ends up back in the hospital, shouldn't we be looking at that? And this is what this new metric that they're considering would be. Well, and, and the new measure also accounts for those patients who are very sick. Right. That that transition to the the, the post acute facility, but you know there's a chance that they could degrade and end up back at the hospital. And this this accounts for that. Right. And and the thing to keep in mind here is the metrics are a little bit different too, because in the first one, the one you're used to looking at. It's the patient leaves the hospital and comes back within 30 days. That is not the timeline for this new metric they're considering. In the second metric, the timeline begins ticking from the point that the patient leaves the skilled nursing facility for 30 days. So it may be that that readmission period is longer than the 30 days that you're used to tracking. But again, it goes to the question of coordination of care and what you as a system or a hospital facility can be doing to coordinate that care and to make sure that somebody's really paying attention to that patient's care as they leave your facility. Okay, and CMS is going to make a decision supposedly in 2020 about how they are going to actually monitor this um, the SNF and post-acute uh, quality metrics in going forward. Risk of falls is another one that has changed. And although there are two risk of falls measure and one that you've had on your list of quality metrics for a couple of years now, the reality is this is a different risk of falls. It's much more robust as far as a quality measure. And so you're going to want to look at it differently and talk to your providers about it differently. It still requires the assessment of the risk of falls to be done. However, it also requires a follow-up plan to be developed. And that follow-up plan is not just write something on a piece of paper and next year you'll look at it again. The plan needs to include either balanced strength and gait training, or referral to an exercise program that includes either balanced strength and or gait training, or referral to physical therapy. So it's not a passive metric, it's a very active metric. And the, the good thing is, because I know your providers may have difficulty in every case to get patients on the same page about this, it doesn't require the whole plan of care to be developed in that one uh, visit. It can be developed over a period of time during the 12 months, but you need to have those components there um, during the 12 month look back period to make sure that you have uh, adequately met this measure. So this is what the measures that remain for MSSP for 2019 look like. You have the, the current cap measures and then the new cap measures um, that you, as I said, I'm sure you're already aware of. Um, you've got your all condition readmission, which is just no matter where that patient comes from and what the situation is, if they come back within 30 days and are readmitted, then that it counts towards you as the first facility that discharged them. Um, and that would include your, your SNF cases that are being changed and how they monitor that. Um, the multiple chronic conditions, which we looked at, and then the ambulatory sensitive conditions, the ones that, that CMS feels could have been successfully handled in the ambulatory setting, and yet these pe people end up in the hospital, and then the risk of falls. Then as far as your preventive health, as I said, no pneumococcal, you've got flu, tobacco, uh, depression screening, colorectal, breast cancer, and statin therapy. And then we're gonna look at depression in just a second, but the at-risk population includes depression remission at 12 months, A1Cs, and hypertension under control. Yeah, and so, what I thought was interesting here is with all the work that CMS has done to eliminate duplicate measures, we see to, to depression, depression. And, and this reflects big time on their whole, this is such a high priority of CMS right now, 
is that behavioral health management piece. The first year, those that depression screen, the original depression screen came in for um, MSSP. We were working with sites that if they had 2% having been yeah. assessed during the year for depression screen, it was, I, I mean, the, the uh, national average had to have been well under 10% because it just wasn't in people's workflow. And now you have not one, but two measures. Right. And that first measure, the depression screening and follow-up plan is not an easy one by any sense of the imagination. It's not an easy one to document or really to even understand. And what this measure looks at is it actually includes ages 12 and up, though they may not be in your population, but you perform an age appropriate, uh, you use an age appropriate screening tool. They are screened once per performance period. And if positive, then a follow-up plan is documented on the date of the screen. You can't document it later. You have to develop your plan of care right then. Also in your documentation, you must include the name of the age appropriate screening tool that was used uh, for that has to be in your documentation and your follow-up plan can be uh, the, 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 the treatment. Like if you're using a pharmacological treatment, if you refer them out to uh, a psychologist or to a behavioral health program and you know, or what the care plan is going to be around that patient. So that is by no means an easy measure to document. And then your second measure, the de depression readmission or de depression remission at 12 months, that measure actually looks at ages 18 and up. You know, the patient has to have a diagnosis of depression and also have a, uh, the depression diagnosis and a PHQ of nine or greater during the identification period, which is the governmental physical year for the preceding year. So for 2019, it would be 11-1-2017 to 10-31-2018. That makes up your denominator. All the patients that had depression that 12 months ago were, were identified as a depression and had a PHQ of nine. Patients will get in the numerator for that measure if they have a PHQ nine score of less than five at 12 months, give or take 30 days. So the it's very important that the time of the re evaluation of the patient occur within a month of the original diagnosis. So, you know, again, those depression measures, we're pointing them out because they are out of these other measures are probably some of the most difficult to document. Yes, I agree with that completely. Okay, let's look at what was and was not finalized and what was proposed as far as new alternative payment models for CMS, because again, I think it's important that people understand because CMS is so pushing alternative payment models over the next few years. And so um, as, as they become final, we'll, we'll talk about the structure then, but I think it would help you to understand what was proposed. So this was a rule that was proposed, I don't know, I think it was August. And of which these points weren't finalized. Um, so you just have to keep in mind what was and was not finalized. They, what CMS is trying to do in all their discussion went to was the fact that they feel that the shared savings program was, has not been successful at cost savings. Um, they find that there is a lower percent of the shared savings that are sharing savings, but uh, a much lower percent that are meeting cost thresholds than those that are two-sided risks, which are the next gen and AC, uh, uh, MSSP1 uh, plus model. And um, I forget what the third one is, but, but the, the reality is that CMS wants to phase out the shared savings with no risk attached to it. And in the proposed rule, this, they were going to be phased out by 2020. Shared savings, um, if in fact you upped and stayed in the program for another two years, which would mean that you would have had to have been contracted right now, your share, potential shared savings would drop from 50% down to 25%. And I think CMS felt that this would be the stick between the carrot and the stick 
to push people who are in shared savings towards the two-sided risk to get that possibility of savings at a higher rate. And participants would be allowed who are in shared savings to terminate their relationship as a shared savings model anytime between now and the end of 2020 to begin a two-sided risk model sooner. But this was not finalized in that form. The proposal was to create two tracks for this new risk-bearing model. They, they called it a basic model and an enhanced model. The basic model incorporates a lot of the structure of the shared savings program as it currently exists, but it's a five-year, what they call glide path. So a five-year contracting period of which the first three, first two years, you would not assume risk, and it's only in the later years um, that you do assume risk, and it really is only in the fifth year that you would be considered an advanced alternative payment model for purposes of the QP bonus. The enhanced model is for programs that were sophisticated to begin with or have been part of an ACO model to this point in time. So it's someone with experience and they'll judge that based upon the background. You know, is it a large system? Have they had uh, the ability to do care management? Or do they have some type of financial modeling? But basically it's to push people who have had experience with the ACO model into an immediate two-sided risk-bearing model. The um, incentive is to, you could share up to 75% as opposed to 50% of the uh, shared savings with CMS, obviously with the offsets and stuff. And But the downside risk is from 40 to 75% up to the 15% benchmark. So that is what was proposed. This is what is being argued about especially the enhanced model and the uh, amount of risk that would be bear, born, excuse me. Um, there are other benefits, though, of that enhanced model. It's kind of interesting. We're looking at that. Mm -hmm. It reminds you of some of the other programs, um, Medicare Advantage, and actually some of the Medicaid Medicare programs uh, yeah. allow for, for some of these benefits. So you'll, you'll see. Some of the things that would be perks that would come with that enhanced model is you could bill for telehealth services without being in an area that would normally be covered for telehealth because I think you, most people recognize that in order to adopt telehealth, you have to have been in a rural area. I mean, there are certain restrictions about when you could use it and bill for it because it's a better billing model. Um, you can utilize the uh, three-day SNF waiver rule where you don't have to have the patient hospitalized for three days before making a determination about sending them to a skilled nursing facility. Um, you would have the advanced APM status for your Q providers to make them QPs and earn that 5% bonus. But that, and then we're going to talk about that in just a minute. And then um, you have a beneficiary incentive program could be baked into the enhanced model. And this is what we were saying. We see this in some of the Medicaid models and in Medicare Advantage and stuff. But here are some of the beneficiary incentives that could be used. You could have vouchers for over-the-counter medications, vouchers for transportation to get patients to and from their um, providers, um, appointments, or in some cases, I know it's been used to for food, just to have them go to the grocery store and stuff. And, and these have been shown in the other program, and Medicaid and the, and the Medicare Advantage, to be real good triggers to get patients to to their appointments and to get more healthy. So they, they seem to have responded well to it. So it's about time Medicare also yeah. offer this. So. Yeah, and then items or services that can be used for specific support for your chronic conditions, you know, whether it's an air filtration system, if you've got someone with COPD or asthma, um, whether I, the, I think of some of the, the new uh, pre-diabetes prevention programs oh, yeah. where you, they can give them a scale, you know, uh, stuff like that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that would fall into this area. Um, you could have wellness program memberships, gym membership. You could um, 
uh, give the family uh, some type of alert system, uh, you know, in case the patient would fall or would need medication or whatever. Um, their self-management programs, uh, vouchers for those, uh, which would be, you know, could be the diabetes prevention program, um, mal malnutrition access to meals program, and some type of reminders uh, that can be put on their phone to for medication adherence. So these are all things that could be utilized by advanced models under this this uh, new proposal. And the reason this is done is because if you do not have specific waiver, it's not in the law, that would be considered a conflict of interest for you to basically pay the patient to come in and use your services. And so it has to be baked into the law in order to allow these types of perks to be granted. Let's talk about the all-payer model, because this is really where the rubber meets the road this year. And I think it's good for everyone to understand it, even though I honestly don't believe many of you will be using it this year, but down the road you may have to, and so you want to understand what they're suggesting. The thing about the all-payer model is that it does not replace the Medicare model. So, you, you know, if you have Medicare, one of these advanced payment models, um, next-gen model, let's just say. What they're saying is the all-payer model, I was, I was so excited, Scott and I were, <laughs> like when they announced that our Medicaid program was going to be considered an advanced payment model for episodes of care, we were like thrilled. We thought it was just so great that, uh, you know, we could get all kinds of providers in the state basically qualifying as QPs and getting this additional bonus. But the reality is these other payers are only going to be add-ons to what you have to meet and show that your original Medicare Advantage thresholds were met before you begin adding any other payers to the mix. Yeah, so it, I, the way I had to kind of, Kathy had to really explain this to me time and time again, because for some reason I originally thought this is a standalone model, yeah, and it yeah, doesn't stand yeah. on its own. Yeah, and we, we thought CMS is rewarding everybody in the country for, you know, going in and getting involved in these alternative payment models because we're trying to get health care lower and better quality. Yeah. But that is, no, 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 that isn't really <laughs> it, because the reality is, let, let me tell you what the blog's, Think, think about this, is that uh, for those of you who have been participants in an advanced payment model, you know that to this point in time, you have only been required to have 25% um, of your Medicaid fees, Medicaid fee for service uh, payments come through the APM or I think it's 20% of your patient Medicaid um, Part B patients, I mean, I'm sorry, not Medicaid, Medicare Part B patients are your two threshold, eligibility thresholds to be part of an advanced APM. And for most groups, those were not that difficult to meet as a threshold. But let me show you something. Um, we'll look at that in one second. Okay. Starting in 2019, those thresholds change and they go up significantly. So you're going from 25% in 2018 to 50% of your um, dollars that come through Medicare Part B as being the requirement for what flows through the APM, or 40% of your patients, and 40% uh, of Medicare Part B patients. But the reality is that's only the beginning. I don't know if you remember several years ago when these regs were first coming out and they, they put this timeline into place and it was like, whoa, that seems like it's really strict. And then they kind of put it to one side for a year or two. But now we're on the track where they're going to increase. And actually, the percentages go up to 75% of all your payments for Medicare Part B have to come through 
the APM, and I think that's within the next couple of years. I can't honestly tell you which year it is, but you see what I'm saying. The problem is that even though you may have originally qualified under the original Medicare proposal as a Medicare, what they call Medicare option, APM, that you may have more and more difficulty meeting that and being able to qualify your part, uh, your providers as QPs, which then gives you that 5% bonus for everybody. So it's really important that you think about what's going on here, because I think there is a whole lot of strategy involved in how you're going to use this all-payer model. It's not an easy model to use, but let's, let's go back here and look at what uh, <clears throat> CMS says. You must already qualify through the Medicare option. As we said, 25% of your payments or 20% of your patients. And if the provider is not a QP, as they have originally been assessed by CMS, you can use patients or payments from other payers to supplement that to meet those thresholds that you need to be a QP. So to me, the all-payer model, separate from what I originally thought, that this was CMS's attempt to coordinate quality metrics, what it really is is an attempt to keep people in these alternative payment models to allow you to qualify more of your providers for the 5% bonus. So the eligibility period in 2019 to decide who's going to be a QP will be, they'll have three periods, look back periods, where they, they see uh, what your numbers look like. It'll be March 31st, June 30th, and August 31st. And if you qualify, if you are a full 10 APM, meaning that all your providers in the 10 are part of that, you can qualify as a group. If you are not a full 10 APM, say you're a specialty group that provides services to an ACO, then you have to qualify individually if you're not a full 10 involvement. What, um, what you were going to have to do, and this is why Scott and I were, were working this through this morning about the amount of work it's gonna to take to document these all-payer APMs, and, and I'll, I'll go through every step with you in just a second, but let me just put in your mind, since many of you we've worked with over the years on Medicaid uh, EHR incentive program, we think it's going to be a similar type of reporting where you're going to have to draw reports, you're going to have to, they're going to have very specific fields that you have to send up. And then CMS is going to review it all and then tell you, I think by December, whether or not all your providers qualify as QPs or whether individual ones qualify as QPs. And so you, you have to strategize this whole thing and recognize where you are in relation to doing MIPS reporting or doing just APM reporting. But the reality is you're going to have these eligibility periods and you're going to have to develop eligibility reports if you have providers that you're trying to qualify as QP that may not have been QPs before. Okay, we looked at that one already. So back just very quickly so that you understand how CMS kind of bent the rules for these alternative payment models. You have those three areas that APMs need to meet. You need to have the CERT requirement, you need to have your quality requirement, and you need to have your risk bearing. CMS had a problem with the CERT requirement, and this we talked directly with them, so we know this. Many, if not most, payers do not require their providers to have an EHR system. Some of them have given you bonus points if you do, but for the most part, that's not in their, their wheelhouse. They, they mainly are interested in are you doing care coordination and stuff. So in order to meet this requirement of an APM and include some of these other models, CMS had to bend this requirement. And for example, Medicaid, and we'll show you how Medicaid responded to this, Medicaid was very creative in how they showed that the number of providers uh, were over 50 percent. <clears throat> um, so CMS, rather than just saying that it does not, that it has to be a contract term between the payer 
in the provider to have an EHR system and report on it. It instead can, you can document it any way you can provide information to show that at least 50% of the providers in the program are covered by EHR systems. Um, that's just saying again that they can, they can submit that. The um, quality metrics are always going to be whatever the payment program requires. There's no standardization to it, just requiring that it have that kind of uh, outcome. evidence based uh, yeah. Yeah, an outcome, right? There's no change in the risk bearing, so uh, that's not a problem. You want to know when you're considering these models is that there are actually some pilots going on with the Medicare Advantage programs called MACI, and um, they are five-year program where they're testing out putting these Medicare Advantage programs into the all-payer model. But I have not seen anything that showed that any of the Medicare Advantage programs had gotten recognized as an all-payer participant for 2019 at this point, other than in these pilots. So what has to happen is either the payer has to register with CMS prior to the start of the performance year to show that they have met the requirements of an all-payer model, which is basically the same ones for CMS's APMs, um, or at the pay, not the patient, the provider or the provider group is going to have to provide that documentation. So that's why we're shaking our head. This is yeah. this can be a heavy lift depending on what you're trying to accomplish. I just don't see the payers doing this work. It's yeah. going to be on the providers or on the organizations back. Yeah. And it, it depends. They, I mean, they may do it, and actually in Ohio, the other payers may piggyback on what Medicaid did, and we'll show right. you that in a second. So um, the other thing that was complained about by the payers um, in the original proposal for the all-payer was to require them to certify every single year. They had to attest that th their providers met all the requirements of being an APM and stuff, and that their um, quality metrics hadn't changed, and blah, blah, blah. And there was a lot of pushback on that from the payers. And so CMS is like, okay, okay, you don't have to file anything else with us unless there's a change. You don't have to test that it's always the same. You don't have to test that X number of providers are on EHR systems or that our quality metrics is the same. The only time of fi our filing is required is if there's some change in the way that that pay for performance uh, program is structured. <clears throat> The, um, the nice thing about this, and we have to see how this works out, but they are moving from an individual provider to provider, you know, check on it, see if they qualify type of thing, to allow you as the TIN or the organization to do the filings and to determine eligibility all at the same time. And, and that actually is probably the only thing that makes this really workable. But we want to take a minute to show you before we, we um, split up on this is how this works in Ohio because I just think it's important people understand this. There's so much going on in Ohio. We're so much further ahead of other states that if it's something you want to make use of, you have to understand how to get your data. So in Ohio, uh, we obviously have quite a few shared savings. We have over 20 of them. And those are ones that would have to convert into two-sided risk in order to take advantage of this alternative, uh, advanced alternative payment model. But we already have um, two next gen and uh, one one plus, uh, three one plus models. And I think we probably have some more have come in. So, but people are starting to get into the risk bearing model. And so it's those organizations that are going to have the opportunity to use the all-payer model to get all your providers to QP status um, if you are doing a two-sided risk bearing model. <coughs> this is what CMS put out on there are two different avenues of being uh, a recognized all-payer participant. 
One are Medicaid, Medicaid programs and one are other payers. The Medicaid list came out uh, about a month, month and a half ago, and Ohio is probably the largest of the Medicaid programs that took advantage of this and got our episode-based model recognized as an alternative, advanced alternative payment model. Here's some of the non-Medicaid ones that were recognized, not a very long list, the ones in Pennsylvania, but we have seen nothing, as I said, out of other Ohio payers or Medicare Advantage payers. This is how CMS, or not CMS, how our Medicaid program managed to qualify, even though, as you know, for Medicaid CPC and for episodes of care, Medicaid has no basic requirement for use of an EHR system. So I, I couldn't figure out how they could qualify as an APM, but this is what they did. They were very creative. What they did is they said, okay, CMS, we're going to use your own statistics because we are sure that we meet that 50% threshold, which will now be 75 moving forward. But um, So they went to the CMS website and pulled up the annual reports on EHR utilization, which were documented by attestations of meaningful use. So they showed that 100% of all Ohio hospitals are participating um, in, we're using EHR. And 76% of all Ohio physicians have adopted EHR systems. And so when they, and they then went on to show that 83% of all Ohio providers participate in Medicaid. So given those statistics, they said we have crossed the threshold to show that our program has that eligible requirement um, eligibility requirement for use of a certified EHR system. So if you as a provider group are interested in using your Medicaid um, episodes of care numbers to supplement your Medicare numbers in 2019, you will not have to prove any of this. Medicaid has already done this for you. They went on the second um, metric criteria that CMS requires from these all payers is a question of the quality uh, metric being close to either a national standard or what's used by MIPS. So this was what Medicaid uh, released or sent to CMS to show that their quality metrics were the same. They mapped out what was being asked for the episodes model and then the related either um, journal information or NQF number or other site of um, evidence-based medicine that recognized those quality metrics. They then looked at the risk factors and the way, I don't know if any of you have spent much time looking at the episodes of care for Ohio's Medicaid, but you really want to because it really kicked in the gear in 2018 and even more so in 2019. But basically, all your episodes of care for the episodes that CMS has identified linked to payment, 100% of your cases are at risk. And so you meet that risk uh, requirement like right off the bat and and we I'm hoping to get Medicaid for a joint webinar in the next month or two to, to explain more of the episodes but I think it's just really important that you should understand that um, and this goes into how they presented the risk factor um, we want to show you just as we wrap up the Episodes report what is available that you could make use of if you need to do an all-payer filing that includes your Medicaid numbers for your organization. The one thing I would remind you, and this is like just a whole little hole in the fabric that you need to be aware of, is as you know, CMS, when they work on their alternative payment models, it's done by TIN. And uh, Medicaid does not do their reporting by TIN. They instead do it by Medicaid ID. So if you have one TIN, and some of you do, you have very large organizations with one TIN for your ambulatory providers, the reality is if you have different Medicaid IDs for different sites, you're going to have to access all those Medicare and Medicaid IDs 
reports in order to combine them for your filing. And you find these reports in the MITS system, M-I-T-S. Yes, right, for the Medicaid. This is an example, this is a screenshot of the type of detail that you get, very detailed reports. I am very proud of our Medicaid system on these. They've done an excellent job with their reports. But you can see that if you need to file with CMS to prove either by provider or by organization, um, the engagement in the episodes of care, they provide this level of detail and they show the amount of money that you are uh, at risk for, for each of the episodes, the dates of the episodes, um, the amount of spend for them, and uh, anything else that you would need to know to submit that. So, and you can sort that, you can actually get it as a um, Excel file and sort it by provider should you need to do that. And even though you see patient name here, just keep in mind this is an example, those are not real patient names, this is not yeah. real patient information. Yeah, and if you need to, you could even um, delete that, that file or that uh, column and just go with the Medicaid ID number if you needed to to send to um, CMS. The other thing which we wanted to show you, it's so that you had some idea of what was available to you as a tool for this Medicaid episodes of care reporting, is this is the overall report kind of uh, dashboard. And for those of you who have done CPC with them, you know that they have really good dashboards for those, very good reports. Um, and the same thing is true with episodes of care. And every single provider in Ohio is subject to the episodes of care. So you don't even have to wonder whether your providers are eligible. It's only if they are engaged in that particular episode of care. But in the report that you can pull up, find the person in your, in your organization that has access to the MITS MITS uh, reporting for Medicaid, and you can pull these up. But if you look at that box three, it actually gives the totals for the episodes uh, by, the, uh, there we go. Um, so you can show what's been included or excluded. They'd all be subject to the same program. Exclusion has nothing to do with the fact that it's, I mean, it's still considered part of the episodes of care. Now I want to, the very last thing we're gonna do is just very quickly show you, this is the reference piece that CMS or um, Medicaid uses on the episodes of care because I just want to explain something for you when you're considering your monitoring for episodes of care. The episodes of care, if you haven't worked with it, can be a little confusing and intimidating when you get into it because CMS or um, Medicaid is adopting different episodes every year for the next, uh, the whole period is like a five year period. We're in the middle of that now. And not every episode is linked to uh, payment risk, but uh, they make very clear what is. But I wanna show you how you know, what they call them waves. So wave one and wave two are already in existence as far as episodes of care in Ohio that are being tracked and and um, judge for uh, risk. Three, four, and five, well three is divided into three year period and those will be the next um, episodes coming in. And you can see a lot of episodes, especially the ones that are there right now, are uh, surgical or hospital-based episodes, but there are a fair number that are also ambulatory. So it may include a lot more of your population than you think, because you've got ones like urinary tract infection, upper respiratory infection. Um, Even the headache and low back headache pain. Headache and low back pain, depression, you know, stuff like that. And the way you know whether it is attributable to your provider is you look at, this is the next page of the report, and on the left-hand side is the, the episode name. The next column over, the first white column, is called PAP, and that's, um, that's the attributable provider. And what's interesting about this is you really need to look at that because the attribution may be to the facility, to the hospital, as opposed to the provider, or it may be to the surgeon, or it may be to the primary care. So you want to look at that PAP 
to know um, which of the episodes are track, uh, able to be tracked back to your providers. Um, and your, if, if you're in an alternative payment model that includes your hospital too, you would include all these measures. The reality, as I said, is you've got ones like upper respiratory um, that show that it is a physician or group that can be attributed to that particular um, episode. And so if you have to do individual attribution, you can track back to see which ones are involved here. And then it goes through, tells you what triggers the episode, what the ages are, what the duration, and then what lab tests or other uh, supporting documentation there is. So Medicaid has a lot of information on this. If you are planning to use um, Medicaid's episodes of care to supplement your Medicare APM totals, especially as they start increasing the totals, to try to get your whole group um, at QP status, you, I, it would really be a good idea for you to get in there and look at those reports and get comfortable with what you're working with. I am sure that CMS is going to put out more guidance over the next couple of months about um, alternative payment model, um, all-payer model filings, but, but just kind of a heads up, be, be watching for it. So with that, well, what do we have? we have any questions here? Uh, I believe we do have some questions. Let me pull those up. All right, give me just a second here. Make this screen a little easier to read. All right, question one. So if we report as a group in our ACO and a provider may not be a non-participating provider according to the QPP website, would we still have to opt in for each of those providers even though they are under our group 10 for our group. That's a... No, I, no, 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 you would not. So let's just say, and we've had a lot of groups do this. You know, you may be in an advanced alternative payment model, but you're a little concerned about whether you're going to have anybody fall out or, you know, for different reasons you may. And so they do a group filing for um, MIPS, and they, that would cover them, you know, the group filing would cover them. Where or how do we access the Ohio Medicaid episode dashboard? That's through the MIT system, M-I-T-S. Yeah, and, and check on with your either billing department, um, finance, somebody has access to the MIT system if you don't. And you can be given credentials to get into it, to get those reports, but they're very, very detailed. Okay, and this one, I understand this question. Can you please elaborate again on how the Medicaid episodes of care can or will play a part in our ACO? And okay. I had to hear it two or three times <laughs> myself, so I can completely understand. Um, the ACO, if you are Medicare insured savings moving forward, you are not part of the, um, you cannot be part of the alternative, advanced alternative all-payer model in 2019. You have to be in a two-sided risk model to take advantage of the all-payer model. So let's say for the for this example though, they're in a track one plus. So they yeah, do let's have say they're, they're one plus. If yeah. you're a one plus, I'm going to guess when you got into it that you were pretty comfortably meeting the 25% threshold that your Medicare uh, billings needed to meet in order to establish QP status for some or all of your providers. As CMS increases those requirements, because next year it'll be 50% of your um, Part B billings need to come through the ACO. Uh, if they are not, then the use of Medicaid or another uh, payment model that's been recognized as meeting the requirements of an advanced APM um, will allow you to supplement your totals for Medicare to show that your, pay, your providers have met the QP status and are eligible for the 5% bonus right off the top, which is, as you know, gets paid as a lump sum as opposed to attached to claims. Okay, I think that was our last question. Okay, well, thank you so much. And as we get more information about this new model, we will let you know. And as I said, we will reach out to um, Medicaid so they can 
maybe walk us through um, all the information that's available as part of the Episodes of Care model. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend.